So we're using the uh, lionfish tool here to look at this uh, control set. We're almost finished um, with this particular control. We'll probably end it today um, so that you guys can ask all the questions you were storing up all this time about some of these different components. Um, we left off at uh, use standard hardening configuration templates for application information, infrastructure, sorry. <clears throat> so your developers, these are this is an application based uh, system where you're building apps, you're building uh, you're coding, you're doing you know you're, you're doing all these different kinds of, of application development uh, rituals. You need to follow something called the software development life cycle, um, which you can easily look up online. It's not a secret or it doesn't require any kind of uh, paywall to get get at that because it's a, it's a standard process. And there are hardening configuration templates for applications that you can you can look up as well. Um, your programmers are going to know these. Uh, I would send them to a security application security class training class, and I know I take the the curriculum from that class and use it as your uh, as your default hardening configuration um, process. And you're going to want to create a template or a policy that talks about this and uh, keep it in your organization as how you harden your software, um, how you harden your configurations. Separate production and non-production systems. In the software development lifecycle, um, one of the things you're gonna do is you're gonna have three different environments. You're gonna have dev, test, and prod. So you're gonna have these three different environments on three different VLANs or three different separate hard networks. That means that you're going to have three individual networks uh, where no other networks can reach them. Either they're separated by firewalls or they're separated by routers or they're separated by layer three or layer two switches or they're separated completely by like physical, physically separated. So you're going to want to have those three environments. Dev, where you develop your software, your developers work in that environment. It's a, it's a carbon copy of your prod environment. Um, and then you're gonna have your QA environment where you test and it's also going to be, it doesn't have to be a carbon copy um, as tests can be a little bit less uh, ex expansive as your, is your, uh, your prod environment and dev, they're really just going through and running through the, the routines of testing your software with, with these third party uh, products that you can use for QA testing, the stress test applications and so on and so forth. And then, and then prod Prod is what you release your, your QA environment to. And after everything's been tested thoroughly, you're, you produce, uh, you, you put it into prod and your production environment, of course, is your customer facing environment or your, uh, or your, you know, your in house environment, your intranet, your internal network, whatever anybody's going to be using these production based applications for, um, is, is that environment. Train developers and application security concepts and secure coding. As I said before, you want to send them to a security class, basically, or have one internally that you've you've uh, acquired. Um, but you want to make sure that you have some sort of security class. Either it's over a PowerPoint presentation, it's a formal class in a classroom environment, um, or a third party gives the class, um, and then you want to gather up all that information from that class and and keep it as your pro your process, your policy. And from that class, they're gonna learn how to, um, you know, use standard hardening configuration and use uh, apply secure design principles in the application architecture. So this isn't something you can really like tell your engineers to do, um, like, hey, just use apply secure design principles. You're gonna want to have them go to a formal um, a formal training program. Um, you can find them online. Uh, they're, they're not hard to find. Um, you can make one of your, of your own if you're really that high end in the security design principle arena, you can make your own class and, uh, and give it to your, give it to your tech or give it to your developers, give it to your QA engineers, give it to your um, production mate, you know, IT staff. Leverage vetted modules or services for application security components. Vetting something is by like pre-looking at it, 
pre pre uh, evaluating it um, and making sure that it is secure. Uh, a, mo a, a module that you might want to use inside of your application, it could be it could have been um, compromised at some point, but you want to look up on like security uh, websites to ensure that modules, uh, again, the internet is a great source of knowledge. You're going to find out if the module is secure or has it been compromised recently or does it need to be patched. And when you're going to run your security tests later on, we're going to talk about penetration testing, it's going to find out if that module is secure. Um, so implement code level security checks. If you're coding, your development team needs to have some sort of a, your, within the software development lifecycle, they're going to need to test, you know, do their own brand of testing and uh, beyond what the QA department is going to do. And they're going to, you know, have a checklist based on the secure design principles and the um, security hardening configuration templates, they're going to have a task to perform, a checklist to, to complete on, on implementation of the, of the code level security. So they're gonna have a checklist of code level security items that you're gonna wanna document and you're gonna wanna produce that checklist that has been gone through um, for all of your, of all of your, uh, revisions, versions that you push forward to QA. So you're going to have a dev, you're going to have a version, you're going to have a, a, a particular revision of the software, you're going to produce it, and then you're going to create a security checklist against it based on, you know, the secure design principle methodology you created earlier um, that maybe you created or maybe you got from a class or maybe you got from some from one of your higher end engineers. And so you want to document that on a regular basis that you're doing those security checks every time you have a version or a revision or every time you do uh, any kind of uh, update, upgrade, or anything you want to do to that to your code. Conduct application penetration tests. There's several different types of penetration tests. One of the penetration tests is a social penetration test where people will call into your company um, and they'll pretend they're other, you know, they're hackers and they'll actually try to get social information from your team. There's also a penetration test where they will scan your network. They'll do like a, a, a port scan across all of your, your network nodes that are external. And there's vulnerability scans, which are internal. But the penetration test on the external ports once they find a port is open, they'll launch a bunch of bots against it and attack it with a well-known attack, um, well-known attack uh, pro, uh, signatures. Same goes for your application. Once there a port is detected that that application sits on, and the most common one is SQL, um, they will launch SQL penetration tests. They'll inject. They'll try to inject your SQL with you know some sort of code they may run something called a denial of service attack they may run something called a brute force attack um where a brute force attack will be that they'll try to overload the memory on the computer by sending it too many commands and then it goes into a state where it could be compromised there are penetration tests of this sort are done by tools or companies it's not done by you you don't just scan it and, and run your own penetration test. You also don't want to run your own penetration test because if you produce results for yourself, it's like you cooking your own dinner. You're not going to get an honest, you know, um, response. You're you're just going to think it's the best. And you're going to think it worked, but in reality, you want a third party to to run your application penetration tests. These I've seen be anywhere from $1,000 an IP to any upwards of $30,000, $40,000 uh, for an for a, uh, application penetration test. So it can be very expensive. Conduct threat modeling. What is a threat model? You create your infrastructure on paper. You create a workflow diagram of all that information 
and how it flows through that infrastructure doc. So now you have an infrastructure document and you have a workflow document, and then you imagine threats that could possibly be going through that infrastructure and attacking you on at all the levels of your inf that your infrastructure shows. So you have your firewall, you have your router, you have your switch, you have your server, and then in between all those layers, you may have, um, you know, access points, um, you know, uh, applications, uh, servers, <clears throat> workstations, printers, in all in in between all those layers. So what you're conducting is you're going, okay, well, what, how would somebody get through our firewall? They may do a brute force attack. They may spoof a VPN client. They may, um, you, you know, do something like that. Or they may sit in your parking lot and scan your Wi-Fi network for, uh, you know, and scan it and sit there on top of it. And if someone logs into it, they might capture that traffic that's going out there in the wild and they may replicate your, um, your your session and they may break in that way. They may break into your facility and put uh, uh, an access point in one of your conference rooms, something no one would notice, um, or a thumb drive access point into, into one of your computers where no one would really notice that this was happening because it's on the back of your computer and you don't go look back there very often. So how would you know if someone put a... Uh, something like that. There's other things called rubber duckies and, and uh, you know, USB sticks of different kinds. <laughs> Excuse me. So there are all kinds of different ways that, and kits that you can buy online that allow you to break into companies. So you want to threat model that out. You want to say, how would, how would somebody attack me? You do that by creating a, a network diagram and a, an information flow diagram, and then you imagine attacks against yourself. Designate personnel to manage incident handling. So you want to come up with a, a, a group or a responsibility or a role of people that handle incidents. Um, you do that by having an identity engine. You want to have, always have an identity engine. That's like the core principle I tell everyone. Start with identity. Once, because once you start with identity, then you'll have roles, logins, users, passwords, uh, all that. And when you do that, you're going to identify a person or group or company or third party that handles incidents. And there's an incident handling um, uh, handbook that Jeremy has that he can share with you um, that will uh, that we can that you can see how incident handling is taken care of. It's like a 15 page document. So. Establish and maintain contact information for reporting security incidents. If you're PCI compliant, if you're HIPAA compliant, if you're a major corporation, you're going to need to have a communication path to your uh, your end users, to the government, to Visa, to the FBI, to MasterCard. There's uh, I have in my incident handling response program. There's there's templates for all those groups. You can use it to uh, contact them and their numbers and their phone numbers and the contact people in there that you would need to notify. You've seen this many times where people's networks are compromised and they send out a press release or something like that. Establish and maintain an enterprise process for reporting incidents. Again, my incident handling response document has all that in there and uh, you can use it to, uh, you know, report the incident properly to, to monitor the incident, to track, you know, and to do cause and root cause analysis needs to be done, that kind of thing. So use that incident re response template that you can get from Jeremy. Establish and maintain an incident response process. Again, no, nothing different. That incidents handling uh, document will show you how to do that. Uh, again, you just have to create something where you notify the right people, you track the incident, you have open a ticket in your ticketing infrastructure, you track the ticket, you do cause analysis, you document, you meet with your group, you talk to them about what happened and uh, and, and that kind of thing. So that, that process document needs to follow anytime there's an incident. Uh, we just had an incident yesterday. Um, somebody was, uh, one, of, one of our customers was um, in an ocean 
um, out out by South Korea. So alarm alarm came up and everybody reacted to it. We uh, you know triaged the incident. We prioritized it. We did an investigation, which is all in the incident handling handbook. We did. We found out that it was you know it was an okay situation um, because that per, you know that customer runs ships all over the world. It was okay. And so we, we, we tabled it, we documented it and cause analysis was that just in, in, in any event, when you're in the South Korean sea, uh, you know, the, our incident response system, um, which is a SIM, uh, goes, fires off and says, Hey, something, something odd about this. And so we took care of it and that's, that's how you do it. And during that time we assigned key roles and responsibilities. We had the investigator, we had the manager, we had the tech. Everybody had their roles. Everybody had their responsibilities. Everybody knew what to do um, based on the fact that we 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 talked about this uh, threat model um, where, you know, somebody is close to a country that might not be reputable. If there's uh, certain kinds of different logins that are occurring or new devices, we would want to know about it. We would want to be aware of it. And so we are. So that's uh, that's great. And and those key, some key people were involved, everyone knew what was going on and everyone took care of their situation as they should. Divine mechanisms for communicating during incident response. You should have a ticketing system and everyone who is on the team should have access to the ticketing system. That's a centralized location. You're gonna need a ticketing system anyway for all the other things that you need for this particular control set. So if you get a ticketing system, it should have the capability of sharing the you know what work is being done and allow anyone who's on the team to add notes to it and then what happens is you have a record of what happened and what you did so you you want to have a ticketing system zendesk or autotask or connect wise or uh zoho there are all a bunch of different ticketing systems out there now so you, you need it it's a third party system Kentuck Conduct routine incident response exercises. So you want to create fake uh, uh, fake scenarios. We do this twice a year with our customers. Create a fake scenario like uh, UPS driver seen exiting a conference room. Um, uh, sometimes the customer will ask for one, uh, which would be what one which was interesting that I saw was files uh, were were moved around. Uh, within their file structure, they were wondering why that was. So we we created an, uh, an exercise to try to figure out what, what happened and cause analysis and what we would do and how we would respond. But it was just very strange that they want, you know, that they had that happen and they wanted to know why. So they included it in the fake exercise. But CEO kidnapped, uh, passwords changed without your knowledge, uh, you know, um, belligerent employee, that kind of thing. Those are all incidents and those all can have, you know, responsive, you know, incident response plans that, that you create fake, fake exercises for. So you know what to do in the event that, 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 that does happen. Like when the ship w went into the South Korean sea, we had already run through a, a threat model and an incident, a fake instance response about what would happen if we got logins from new devices and strange ocean areas we already ro rolled through it, so it was easy to uh, was easy to conduct a you know a response. Conduct post incident reviews again during your fake incident response, or even during your real incident response uh, plan. Uh, you know situations, you're going to want to create a post mortem meeting where you sit there and have a meeting where you you can also do cause analysis during that meeting, and you could talk about how you're going to fix those problems in the future so that they don't happen. Um, you know, if someone's moving files around and you figure out, we, we figured out what was, what happened and how it happened, we would then talk about how to, to possibly curb that or change it or educate the customer or end users on not moving files around without permission in certain, in certain areas. And so that's what we did. We created a policy that said, these file folders are static. They have uh, paths that attach to them. So if you are going to change them, you know, you need to get go through a review process. And so we pass that out to the company. And, and that's what uh, something actually came up from a, uh, a fake incident response, which is fine, and real ones. 
you're going to want to have, uh, you know, stuff come out of them that, that you can give to the end users or educate them or make closed ports or put in new firewall modules or whatever you want to do to fix those problems. Establish and maintain security incident thresholds. So, a th a, you know, a threshold is an amount. So you want to have only a certain amount of, of alerts that come in before you make some sort of different decisions. So if you have, you know, five criticals coming in from your antivirus software, um, you're going to want to figure, you know, do cause analysis, you know, have an incident response meeting, but you don't want it to continuously get out of control. You don't want it to continuously rise and rise. Like you have 56 um, antivirus uh, alerts, uh, in one month. That's, that's strange. It's, it's too many. You're going to want to figure out why, but you're also going to want to have a threshold number where you say after four, we're going to change, we're going to have to have a meeting and we're going to have to discuss this with amongst a group or after seven different ones of these impossible logins, we're going to have to talk to, you know, everybody or re-educate, retrain, um, communicate, have a meeting, uh, with those groups or individuals and say, look, we're hitting our thresholds for, uh, for incidents and we want to, uh, we want to curb it. So this is like a forward thinking holistic view. Don't get too many problems. Try to keep your problems down to us to a minimum. Um, but sometimes I see companies that have, um, you know, uh, an attack will be launched against their Office 365 account. And there'll be literally millions of, of attempts from Belarus or whatever to root your password, but you have MFA, so it never will work. Um, so you're sitting there getting millions of hits and you're like, oh man, this is going to blow up my incident response threshold. That's true. And so what you want to do is you want to say, look, uh, you go, you can go to Microsoft off, Office 365 and for a fee, like I think five more dollars, you get the a month for your account, you get the ability to block uh, countries and, and IP addresses. And then you can go in there and you can block Belarus and, and that, that way you'll cut down on, on the amount of things. So from the, the threshold does come good things because what you need to do is, is definitely um, take action and, and, and try to stop these things from occurring. And you can figure that out by running, you know, reports from your SIM tool every month. Your SIM tool will tell you you've got 10,000 attacks on your firewall port, you know, 22. Someone's trying to SSH in your firewall like millions of times. You just need to turn that off or turn it on for one particular IP address or so on and so forth. There's so many ways of, of, of uh, circum, circumventing the hackers. Establish and maintain a penetration testing program. There's there's internal penetration tests, which I call vulnerability scans, and there's external penetration tests, which you could relabel it a, an external vulnerability scan and just do a vuln scan of your external network. But that's not what they're talking about here. They're talking about a penetration test, and it is more in line with the 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 social, the ports, and the application penetration tests. Um, that we were talking about earlier. And that's the program they want you to use. And that's usually done by 99% of the time done by a third party. I've seen people get away with doing them for themselves, but it's not, it's it's always been something that they've come back and the vendors ask, can you please have a third party company run your penetration tests? Or can you run a penetration test um, by a third party? I've seen the internal companies do them so that they can fix all the problems that a penetration test officially would create and so they try to circum circumvent the fact that they're going to have to pay a lot of money perform periodic external penetration tests three a year is a lot uh two a year is good uh one a year is not per is not periodic but uh again they're very they can be very expensive so two or three a year is is in line with what what i would recommend uh anything more than that means that you have some sort of a deal where you've or or you have one IP address uh, external or you have one you know you have one website or something like that where it's not super expensive and then you can up it to you know once a quarter four times a year. I wouldn't do it more than four times a year because 
just not going to, you know, they're not going to be that many vulnerabilities that arise. Remediate penetration and testing findings. What's going to happen is you're going to get a report. It's going to say critical, high, medium, low. The critical ones need to be taken care of within 24 hours. Um, the high ones, again, also 48 hours to 72 hours. The medium ones, uh, you can plan out how you're going to resolve them. The low ones and the informational ones, I would take up to a month to fix. Um, usually, they're you can even leave the informational ones alone. They're just telling you something, something is askew but not not vulnerable. Validate security measures. So you're going to want to make sure that once you've run your penetration test, once you've run your vulnerability scan, once you've done your patching, that the next month when you do it again that the stuff from the previous cycle is not still in there. So that's how you validate security measures. You compare the last month with this month or the last scan with this scan. And you show that you do not have the same vulnerabilities from last time, last issued session as you do now. So if you're not validating your security measures, you have to show that you are improving or that you're remediating all your problems and uh, and that they're being resolved. Perform periodic internal penetration tests. You can do a vulnerability scan and I'll, I'll let that, I, I would say that that would be fine. You could also use the types of penetration tests um, that they do externally. But again, if you have a you know you have a two hundred fifty six uh, IP network and they're charging you a thousand dollars an IP address, that's going to be brutal. So you could buy in this situation, you could buy a penetration testing kit or a software product and run an internal penetration test against yourself with that product or that kit, and it'll be okay. No one will no one will fault you for that. They don't want you to run one externally, but you can run one internally. Um, and use a software product, um, again, they, they'll they frown upon it, but you're not going to be spending $256,000 um, scanning your internal network for, for, for vulnerabilities. Or you could use a vulnerability scan. I've seen many people get away with just using a vulnerability scan and calling it a penetration test internally because, again, you're not, like, rigorously attacking, um, you know, an IP address within your within your network. In the worst case scenario, I would do a penetration test of your prod environment internally versus your QA and dev environments. I would exclude them from the penetration test because they're, those environments are somewhat change, can, can change on a regular basis. But it, to be thorough, I would still do a penetration test on all three environments. But if you had to pay... Um, for the internal penetration test, I would only pay for uh, the prod environment to be to be tested because that's the only one really that anyone has, could possibly have access to versus your QA environment, which may even get shut off at night. So, um, so there you go. All right, we finished this entire session. We finished all of this control set for CIS framework control V8. Uh, we went through a lot of stuff. This is a lot of controls. There are tons of technologies that we talked about. There's a ton of activities, policies, procedures. There's a ton of good advice in there about what people are looking for, what auditors are looking for, what what uh, uh, vendors are, are going to ask you questions about. And uh, all the information in all these classes will definitely get you at least to phase two or th phase three, where you're going to be completely buttoned up. May you know, you're not going to be un you know, non aware, which would be phase one. You're not aware of the problems. Phase two, you're aware of them and you're working on fixing them. And phase three would be that you've either fixed most of them or all of them, or you still, or you only have a couple left. And maybe phase four would be you're completely buttoned up tight and strong. So again, we're like a phase two or phase three situation here. If you've been, if you've been paying attention, if you've been taking notes, if you've been, uh, if you want to meet all these controls, if you get lionfish and start filling out all these different, you know, going going into one of these controls and uploading evidence and your policies and procedures, and 
you know, keeping, you know, here you go, uh, the policy you have here, the tasks, the uploads and the notes that you have, you might have interviews with your staff members about how things work and you put it all in here. And then there's, in, and then there's tools and documentation training. There's all these different cap capa capabilities in here. Um, this policy builder helps you build um, policies. And as you can see, it has framework in here that of what I, all the things I talked about, it has your framework. So you don't have to come up with the words. I find it difficult to find sometimes the words to fulfill these different things. It's like, ha, ah, how do, what do I say? I mean, I don't know. Well, this, this takes care of it for you. It takes care of all the different things that a standard template is going to look for, right? If you don't know the words, you got to come up with them on your own, or you got to go on the internet and try to figure out what is right and what is wrong. This already has it for you. It's all the right data. It's the policy. Wow, that's great. That's worth its weight in gold, actually, because it's just going to take really a long time to figure all this stuff out. Any questions on the last class? Gregory, show them the, uh, the, the training tab there and what kind of learning they can get in there. Sure. So the training tab, you can get, um, you know, it'll it'll tell you basically all the things I said to you. It'll say them in, you know, more a, a formal manner, a better, uh, you know, better, dis better description, you know, uh, studyable stuff, stuff you can look at and understand. And, uh, you know, questions and answers, all different kinds of stuff. But you could just... All the things I taught you in this class is all right here. So you can come in here and you can learn, uh, relearn it or re go over it. If you didn't want to listen to me again, you could just be like, oh, yeah, I don't want to hear him again. But I'll read these um, this workbook on how to do it, which is awesome. Now you have the words and you have the training and you have the capacity to track it and keep all that data in one place. Uh, it's the best. I mean, I don't know what more to say. And then it'll keep track of your progress. You could create tasks um, for individuals within your organization. So remember how we talked about roles and responsibilities? You could you could fill the roles into here, and then you could just give each, each of the people you want in your organization tasks to perform. Um, I, I do this all the time for uh, customers that we have. You give them a task. You, you assign it to them. This is an artifact area where they're going to upload the policy, the screenshot, the and, and the new thing we I've been I've been encouraging people to do is an interview. You can do an interview document, and that counts as an artifact as well. So if you're going to sit down with your with your manager and ask them about training, they'll describe it for you, and you can tr you can create a video of or or something of that and upload it here and keep it so that <clears throat> it's an artifact. And then you can hey, make Gregory. This... Oh, go ahead, go for it. Yeah, Gregory, this is Ryan here. Um, I really appreciate what we have available in the way of controls. Is there a way that we can consolidate our findings into a report? Have you covered that recently? I'm looking for a report, like if I wanted to show my leadership overall, here's a high level view, what we found, maybe not as granular, but more of a Here's the major findings we have. Jeremy, can you can you talk to that point? You're you know your product better than I do. Yeah, well, uh, the report itself is going to come from the main page, where the, all the controls are, and we have a we have the simple report for where the, where they are, what the poem is. Um, there's a see the report button there, the blue one on the right, right by your mouse. Yeah. So those are the reports we have right now, Ryan. Uh, we are building and working on some more in-depth reports, but um, but those are the ones we currently have. Good. That answers the question. I'll look into a little bit more, but I appreciate where we're going with this. Thank you. Great. Yeah. Summary report would be great. A detail report, probably not so much for executives, but a summary report would be cool if you just showed them where you where you were in the process. Yeah. Anybody else have any other questions or comments or how to make the show better or worse, whatever you like?
Great job as always, Gregory. Thank you for thank you for hosting the class. We appreciate it. Yeah, and also uh, Jeremy's doing a great job. He's set. He's lining up, you know, uh, formal classes for some of these some of these uh, frameworks where he's, uh, you know, they cost money, but but they're like certification courses and and all that kind of stuff. And again, Jeremy is way more than just helpful. He's so invested in everybody's success uh, that I can't not mention that he's trying to make you successful. He'll help you. I will, I will also help you. We have, again, all these different kinds of policies and procedures. And I can, and over the, you, over the span of decades, I've, I've, I've pretty much done all these audits. So what you can do is get, get from me the exact thing they're looking for. Or like we talked about the incident response plan today, which you can just get from Jeremy. It's a, it's a long document. It has how to report uh, issues to the FBI and the CIA and all that stuff. If you don't have that, it's so hard to, to just find it. Or you have to do something called a paywall where you have to go and you go to like some, some company and they'll, they'll charge you $159 for a document. It's so, it's so tough. So please use Jeremy as a resource and he will come through for you and also so will I. So again, these classes, these, these, you know, types of infrastructure instructional um, sessions are, are you, you could, you could pay a lot of money to, to get them and Jeremy's giving them to you basically for free. So I would take advantage of whatever you could uh, from it, get as much documentation as you can from it. Anybody else have any other questions? We're doing another framework after this one. I forget what it's called, but there's going to be another another one next week. So we'll be starting that one up and rolling through, doing the same thing, understanding the frameworks, getting the understanding the technology, talking it all out. So if you're going to be on, I'll see you then. If you're not, maybe pass the word on to somebody who might be interested. Thanks and have a good day.